Good morning to everyone here from Argentina. It's afternoon in Istanbul, where Mukahit is now. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, bienvenu. Uh, we have the three languages of ISA, French, English, and Spanish. Today, our webinar would be in English, and we are honored to have the head of school of the Istanbul International School that will contact us this webinar that um, the topic of the webinar is um, uh, the international, uh, a little bit about the history of, 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 of the internationalism and, and how the international education started. It started uh, as to uh, give education for the sons and daughters of the diplomats. But I will leave uh, Mukahit to tell everything about this uh, amazing story. Uh, next year, we are going to be 70 years old. So we are thrilled to have this kind of webinar. Next month, we are going to have some students webinar. And well, this Sunday, we are going to have our annual general assembly on our uh, board meeting to discuss uh, the, all the celebrations of next year. Let's hope that the pandemic will let us celebrate. And um, we will keep working to keep uh, giving uh, this kind of services that I think that these conversations and these topics are very interesting, thinking about what, where and what education is going to be uh, in 2030 and, and what education are we going to have. It will be virtually, presentially, a mix. What are we going to do with all our schools, our, our super uh, campuses? Is it worth it? We are going to have homeschooling, so there's a lot of, of issues and, and themes and topics to talk about. But today, uh, the theme is about uh, international education and its history, how to, to recruit teachers. So I will leave the floor to Mukahid. Thank you, Mukahid. And please ask questions, and we will uh, answer them at the end. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mujahid Sekin. I have been the head of school for Istanbul International School for eight years. Um, I guess Istanbul being 12,000 years old and I'm aging too. And that's why they thought it would make sense for me to talk about the history of international education. Uh, we will be talking about uh, history of international education and role of it and also teacher recruitment, uh, the common issues or how to overcome common issues. Um, we have a slide to present. Uh, I think you will, uh, that will help you understand or visualize things in the order it is presented. Let me... Yep. Coming up. Yes, on the left side, you see the beautiful Istanbul uh, in the evening. And on the right side is our upper middle school building that was built in 2014. That had to fit in the city's uh, design or general architecture. So the, up until recently, I was thinking that international education was uh, a startup after the World War II, especially with the impact of globalization. But then getting into deep into the subject, uh, we have found that it's not that new. It's, it's actually way old. And I, before the presentation, I want to thank uh, ISA for giving the opportunity to present, uh, to share the ideas, share the knowledge, because that happens to be our school motto to sharing knowledge, memories, and experiences to last a lifetime. Mukahid, sorry to interrupt you. Do you want to put the presentation on the whole screen? I think that would be better. Yes. Just put present, and I think that. Uh, I'm just trying to find it from here. Is where it says next to share present. Yeah, I'm just trying to click it. Uh, yeah, present view, and I think that's okay. Okay. 
Can you see it now? Yeah, but you see it full screen? Yeah, but I think you have to put that and you have to check that off. One second. Okay. There it is. Perfect. So, in short, three points, history of international education, uh, today's international education sector, the, and the type of personnel needed for the sector. The international education or education of children of different nationalities, it started off in 1862 with an essay competition. And it evolved from there to be a to be an established new school in 1867. Uh, back then with the king's blessing, well, king to be, uh, did the opening ceremony. So there were uh, advantages they were forecasting, like uh, doing better trade or uh, working together with the other nations uh, will be more productive in their thinking. So the, the trio, uh, Richard Cobden, Thomas Huxley, and Charles Dickens were the were the father of the or the parents of the ideas. The in 1862, uh, London International Exhibition had an essay competition, and they, they felt there was a need for international education. There, an, a school was established in 1867 but didn't last too long because of the tensions arising in Europe. It was closed in 1889. From, from the beginning, uh, wealthy families were already sending their kids to France and uh, Britain for education. So that was the natural bet for international education. And remember in the beginning of the 20th century, we had back to back, almost back to back, two wars, and colonial powers were in decline, and the nationalistic movements were rising. And there was a need or dream for a new uh, world order that would allow nations work in peace. Uh, the first international school um, was established in. Geneva aftermath and also probably about a few months later I think was uh, Yokohama, Yokohama International School that was established by YMCA. These are the times that people were desperately look, looking for something that is going to connect this, uh, the, this, this environment disconnected very badly with the wars torn apart and that's why the uh, International Red Cross was established 1863. Seat of uh, League of Nations was established same times. International uh, School of Geneva opinion leaders. Uh, this uh, Marie Theresa Murat, uh, Murat saying that international mindedness needs to be taught rather than caught was actually the main reason. Uh, back then, people wanted to have international education or international schooling. Uh, Robert J. Leach also considered international school to be truly international. But watch this statement. With too much Swiss influence, too many British teachers, and too many American students. Uh, even back then, it was heavily influenced by the British educators. That's why uh, one of the... Uh, revolutionary educator Robert Leach uh, felt the need to make that comment on international education established in Geneva. Uh, when we come to 1950s, then uh, we, have a, we have a blast of international schools around the world because international roaming starts uh, taking place in bulk. Uh, international corporations or corporations becoming international uh, mandated their personnel move from one region, one country to another. That also uh, included international organizations like UNICEF, UNESCO and others afterwards. When they established, they established offices and they had to ask their personnel to move from one country to another. 
and some dates to note in 1951 formation of conference of internationally minded schools resulting in the format formation in the international schools association now that is the uh, organization that we are uh, working under and isa created international school examination syndicate which later turned out to be international baccalaureate organization Um, currently, when you look around the world, there are three major types of international schools. Uh, one type, the one that we are, uh, is international school open for multinationals, many nationals, but in the Turkish setup, not open to Turks. Uh, and there is a accredited, there is an accredited program, internationally recognized program running under the uh, same roof with, in our case, 63 different nationalities. And then there are the other schools uh, from the colonial times, uh, Italian, Austrian, German, French, uh, or any other uh, nation's flagship. These colonial schools are still serving under a special code, special license, uh, from those days because they represent certain traditions as well. Then there are private schools. A good example for that in Istanbul could be Koch Private School. They are running the national program with a lot of international elements in it with international accreditation for their programs as in IB or uh, advanced placement. And they also have heavy uh, emphasis on foreign languages. The role of international schools is a little bit uh, in alignment with the base they are founded on. Uh, our kind of schools are serving the expats living in Turkey for a temporary or permanent time because there are a lot of people choosing Istanbul as a home too. Uh, we are serving their children's educational needs uh, based on Cambridge International Curriculum. Uh, then it is also important for these individuals that international education has to be transferable from one country to another because some of them with temporary contracts or the diplomatic mission, they don't know where they are going to end up next year. That's why transferability is a key for them. Then uh, colonial schools uh, came out as, as a need too because countries wanted to serve their own bloodline or uh, brothers and sisters in the foreign land. Uh, in Turkey, we have, in Istanbul, we have many French schools, for example. They started off with the missionary schools and then turned out to be missionary colonial schools. They are serving, they were serving French community here with the Turkish elite involved. Now they are serving Turkish children uh, with very minimum number of uh, French origin kids and they represent a different echol in education. Uh, schools like Koch schools that you can see on the bottom right, they are serving Turkish nationals. Uh, they can include uh, foreign nationals, but main education language being Turkish excludes foreigners to a certain extent. But they want to have more uh, international weight in their program. That's why they are either preparing their students to international uh, diplomas and certifications or they are preparing their students towards foreign universities that's why they have to put more emphasis on the uh, the foreign language to a certain degree that it becomes second language not only foreign language these uh, schools turkish schools with foreign elements are pushing really hard to be recognized as international minded or they want to set up international mindedness as the base of the culture uh, but it is difficult uh, because in schools like ours it becomes a natural thing to understand that people may be born in one country raised in another country and choose to live in another country and therefore their kids could be speaking for example english as a third, fourth, or even fifth language, not necessarily first language. 
there comes the need for uh, teachers in today's international schools. It's a bit tricky because uh, there are certain guidelines we have to follow uh, when when we are doing teacher recruitment. There are local law, uh, local laws, lo local regulations. There is international standards, uh, and there is um, parental expectation. So in order to put them all in the same box, you have to do a lot of uh, choreography. In the international schools like us, we need a teacher that has an uh, international mindset. Doesn't matter where they are born, raised, or trained, but we need their qualification and understanding fitting to our uh, school structure. In the colonial schools, usually they are important from uh, imported from the the origin of the country, origin of the école. In say the French uh, example we gave, they are usually coming from France, uh, trained, born, raised, trained there, and then they are serving uh, under government or non-governmental organizations in the colonial schools over here in Turkey. On the uh, national schools serving the local uh, students with international elements in their program, they are in need of Turkish teachers who are capable of delivering the content in English language, say for Istanbul. Managing international schools, uh, that is the uh, most tricky one because uh, you have to understand the local law, international mindset. You have to watch for your international school culture in the house. At the same time, you have to protect your organization from the outside influences um, and threats. Then uh, the management description by Jones was, you have to show, uh, you have to suspend disbelief recognize problems and risk-taking as inevitable, give full credit for their achievement and support if they run into difficulties. That's exactly what we do over here at Istanbul International School, because we tell our teachers and everyone under the same roof that it is important to work and produce, uh, produce the service, whether it is up to the standard or not, is something to have discussion on and to improve. But without doing anything, you make no mistakes. So in order to produce something, you have to understand that there will be mistakes and the management is there to support in the case of difficulties. Um, there are organizations rare to support international education, international schools in general. Uh, right now, the only one that I know producing international school teachers uh, is the University of Stendhal. That happens to be also our uh, partner school. Well, we are their partner school. We receive uh, intern teachers at different levels from year one to year four. And lucky enough, we happen to recruit a couple of the interns from Stendhal as well. Uh, the other program, the other organization that supports international schools is University of, University of Bath. They have international teacher training certificates that allow you to work in the same organization, wherever you are, and still work towards your certification for international teaching. Uh, their uh, master's degree or postgraduate programs are really deep and valuable. Um, apart from those, we don't really get much support from uh, government or non-governmental level because people in the local environment usually fear what they don't know the most and they are not really familiar with international schools, what they do, how they do, why they do what they do. Um, ISA is the umbrella organization for us, uh, for international schools, and we get the benefit, multiple benefit of uh, ISA works. 
Um, well, this webinar is one good example of it. And the next year, uh, we will also have the student webinars to uh, connect the dots. Being a member of International School Association, uh, we took part in a youth leadership encounter. Uh, we took part in the Model United Nations in Geneva. And we have done um, joint projects with a lot of schools. Uh, the latest I remember was assisting a school in Myanmar uh, towards their accreditation with Cambridge. And it's not limited to that. There are a lot of a lot of uh, new venues that we can support one another, including the joint projects we are aiming to start soon enough with the school in Mexico. Um, going back to the recruitment part, the painful part for the school management, uh, there are there are certain subtitles we need to look at, like availability, uh, availability of international teachers or highly qualified teachers uh, has to do with political atmosphere in the region. You know, if things are hectic uh, or if the society, if the local culture is not welcoming, then you can't really recruit many and you can't recruit people for a longer term. We have teachers who have been here 12, 14 years already. I myself have been around eight years. And I'm talking about foreign nationals uh, staying at school, coming to Turkey for different reasons, but staying with us for 12, 14 years. The other aspect is stability in the city, region, country. Um, if you have uh, followed the unfortunate set of events in Lebanon, for example, um, we somehow happen to know before things cook up fast. Uh, before the explosion in Lebanon, there were a lot of applicants from the region to Istanbul, and we knew that things were not stable there. We hope that they will recover fast enough because it's a beautiful country with beautiful people. Then uh, availability also affected by attractive location. Um, being in Istanbul, we are lucky, we are blessed because Istanbul itself is an attractive location, so we don't have to go to job fairs to recruit people. They happen to be in Istanbul anyway. Uh, another uh, item contributing to availability of teachers uh, is the multicultural partnership of individuals. We have a lot of uh, families, you know, husband is from Poland, wife is from Finland, or husband is from Iran, wife is from Spain, and they happen to be here, and the partner feeling idle, uh, trying to see the chances and go for the qualifications for international uh, teaching institutes too. Uh, then international partnership of institutions also increase availability of teachers. Uh, that makes it easier for the recruitment, uh, as in, uh, United Nations or UNESCO opening offices or United Nations Refugee Commission opening offices, establishing new entities. They also make it easier for us to recruit uh, because they enlarge the pool. Who to hire is a, is a good question because it um, doesn't matter if I do the interviews for the school, uh, for recruitment or if the deputy has to do the interviews for their own departmental needs. Uh, we say the same thing. It is more important to see a character face-to-face uh, -face or online nowadays before the CV. Uh, CV tells you a lot of things, but uh, in teaching, the character matters more than the CV itself. Then the next item we will look at or we usually look at is the qualifications because we have to submit justification to our own setup, to our own school system for hiring this individual instead of another individual. Um, and there is the legal side of it. We have to prove that this person is legally qualified to teach so we can get a work permit from the local authorities. Then um, comes the parental side. If the person's qualifications are sufficient, then you don't hold back. And you say, well, 
we can meet, I will introduce my teaching team to the class or the individual. Another thing contributing to uh, who to hire question is experience or exposure to international environment. It is very important whether you are the head of school or teacher or the technical personnel. It's important to understand how the other person feels on the other side of the desk. Being new in the country, not mostly not being able to speak the local language, they go through certain psychological phases and you have to understand what they go through. Uh, from teaching teacher point of view, it's extremely important. I'll tell you, um, six, seven years ago, we had a teacher, I'm not gonna tell you where she was from, but uh, she came to me rushing and saying that there was this kid in her class and the kid was too silent, wouldn't have eye contact, this and that, that she was suspecting child might have suffered from this and that. She listed everything on the APA, uh, APA book. But then I just calmed her down and said, look, this kid is from this country, that country, and you are not familiar with the culture. The child is just respecting you by not looking at you in the eye. The child is not talking because doesn't speak a word of English, came from another language school. Uh, so their uh, language base, not, base was not good enough to start it, to initiate a conversation. And you got to understand also that in the West, uh, talking is a very, very important skill embraced. And on the, on the eastern side of the hemisphere, uh, silence is gold. So the kid was not doing anything wrong and he was showing no symptom of anything. He was just being himself. And that was misunderstood. So the experience or exposure of the teacher to international environment is very important again. This is the part that um, that shakes up the founders of the school or the corporations behind the school, the packages. Uh, unfortunately, schools in the Northern Hemisphere may mostly uh, make their income of the tuition and fees. That's why they don't receive bulk donations. They have, they have to make do with a certain budget limit. But some schools or some regions, well, I'll say in the Gulf region, uh, schools can be sponsored by the uh, local billionaires. That's why fees or packages don't matter much. And I remember back in the day in Valencia, we were talking about an ISA meeting that a lot of schools were losing a lot of good teachers to Gulf region because they were given incredible packages. Well, in that package, salary is one item. Private medical insurance uh, is another item. I'll get back to that one. And some school, some teachers are very attracted to professional development opportunities, whether it's on site or face uh, online training whether it is uh, international or local training opportunity, they are digging for it. Uh, then accommodation is another aspect because when you imagine yourself foreigner in a different country where you don't speak the local language, accommodation matters a lot because that eases the pain. Some take it to the next level and offer flight, relocation cost, and all that uh, in, the, in the package. I said I was going to get back to uh, private medical insurance business. Um, for a long time in Istanbul, I thought it was not necessary because Turkish general health coverage is extensive enough, uh, covering every individual in Turkey. In the case of emergency, it doesn't matter whether you are foreigner or local, whether you have insurance or not, emergency services are provided at no cost. But uh, when teachers were asking me about the private medical issues, I didn't understand in the first place. Later on, when one approached and said, look, uh, the, my private health issue becomes a school issue because I have to take my Turkish uh, friend from school to the hospital because the doctors in the hospitals, usually state hospitals, they don't speak English. So very personal uh, information becomes public domain, public information all of a sudden, because I have to take uh, different individuals to different appointments. Then I understood the importance of private medical insurance. And since then we have been providing 
private medical insurance to our teachers. Well, this year everyone under the same roof, and not only teachers, even I do get it. Um, this is my contact information. If you have any questions to ask, uh, we will be happy to help you out any way we can, uh, if we can, of course. Um, msekin at istanbulit.com. Uh, Edgardo can also share the details of communication. And thank you for your patience to listen to. I am ready to answer the questions if I have the answers for, uh, for another 15, 20 minutes. Thank you, thank you very much. Very much. I, think was, I think it was, it was uh, very, very uh, interesting. Very and uh, I have some questions because uh, sometimes uh, it's very difficult to to engage and, and with students and to be uh, have different cultures. And sometimes leadership, for example, uh, in one country or in one culture, uh, is um, and it's considered one thing. For example, if you are very forward or if you are very proactive, that is good in some cultures. And in other cultures, it's not good. So, how do you manage you as, as, as a head of school that has a lot of cultures and a lot of staff from different parts of the world to be a leader and not to uh, sometimes hurt some sensibilities and, 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 and if you are very proactive and in some cultures that, that is not very good received. How, how can you, how can you uh, give us an example of, of management of, of, of uh, tackling these various cultures that you may have at school with parents, students and, and staff? Well, on the student profile, we have 63 different nationalities. In teaching profile, we have 23 different nationalities. But before that, before even coming to this school, uh, we have three different flags represented in my family. So my, my, my wife is from another country, and my daughter was born in a different country. So having that understanding that, uh, you know, carrying different passports don't mean much. And the cultural differences are easy to digest because, again, uh, as I said in the presentation, we fear the most what we don't know. So when we tell uh, students, teachers, uh, even the technical personnel we have on site that it may be uh, a move, a gesture, a sign uh, given or represented this way, presented this way, may mean this way or that way. So there are multiple ways of looking at things that also increases their ability to look at things from different perspectives. So if a child comes and talks about uh, life and death at the age of seven, coming from Muslim background, because in uh, Islamic culture, uh, children are exposed to that kind of knowledge earlier, that can horrify, terrify a kid in they coming from Nordic countries, but then sitting down with them and saying, look, we are not doing propaganda. In this culture, kids are exposed to that kind of knowledge and experience earlier. They are given that kind of information earlier, but in many other cultures, they are not. That itself is soothing the situation, uh, almost putting out the fire before it starts. But it's never ending because, again, uh, the, the silence is appreciated in one side and then talkativeness is appreciated. The personal proximity, the people, I'm sure you are familiar with it, people around the coast of Mediterranean, they are enjoying being arm in arm, hand in hand, very close, very touchy. But then Nordic people or people from the northern hemisphere, they don't feel the same way. Uh, oh, no, it's not whoa, that is a sign of affection in many cultures. Or the definition of religion and uh, definition of cultural values, it's never ending. That's why we have, uh, in the beginning of the school, usually in September, we have World of uh, uh, Day of Languages, Day of World Languages. 
And so each class taking responsibility of representing a country, we, well, having 63 different nationalities uh, is an advantage too. We present their food, we present their uh, cultural visual aids, then they get more familiar with it, then they can understand why these people enjoy seafood that much or why these people enjoy hot food that much. That comes with the food culture because that is very interesting to kids. Then it takes you to the next level of thinking, ah, okay, they are surrounded by water. That's why fish is the ultimate food anyway. So it's never ending. I can't say we finished it all, but uh, in every opportunity with the joint projects we are doing with the other schools or within the groups, we try to uh, dig in more to get more out. And you also have to uh, trust the individual's confidence or ability to talk about his or her own culture. If you ask a non-English speaker to talk about uh, Argentinian culture, I'm sure he or she will find the right words to talk about the culture because that's the part he or she wants to take pride in and talk about. That gives the opportunity for the rest of the crew, rest of the population, to see the best part of the culture and uh, enjoy it. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. I agree. Also, yes, so, um, uh, it's very interesting to see what our youth leadership and culture. Uh, we tackle that. We, we have one issue, and we have some students from all over the world that have different ideas, different cultures, and the diversity, I think, enriches the conversation. And another Another way to also um, share and, and have that experience is in, in, a, in the model of the United Nations that we are going to have next month, that you have to represent a country and sometimes you are not uh, uh, entirely, uh, you, you do not entirely agree of the country, uh, for example, uh, external or uh, politicians or or, or what do they do about child labor? But you have to defend that country because you are representing it. And you learn why they do that, because it's a part of the economy, a part of the culture, and, and why that country suffers that 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 um, uh, that menace, and, and why it does not. So I think also more of the United Nations that, that, that you participate, help the students to understand the world and to fully be uh, global citizens. That, 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 is, that, that is our aim as, a, as an association, and, and I think that it's a aim about uh, for your school also. I have um, some uh, reflections here from John that said, describing yourself as an international school immediately raises the stakes, expectation by parents, students, and teachers. The world is highly charged. And also being international can also make you a soft target for terrorists. <laughs> So that is uh, what John is saying. But but I think uh, me being in Argentina also sometimes uh, and, and being in, in, in this part of the world that is very far away from everything, from Europe, from, from North America, and sometimes uh, from Asia, uh, sometimes it's a challenge to explain uh, what we do here, why, why we have this food culture, why we have, uh, why we are very, for example, as you said, very touchy and very warm, and in the North they, they are not. Now with the pandemic, everything I think was is cold, and now nobody uh, hugs each other or give the hand. So I think uh, a lot of things are going to change. I don't know if we have some more questions, or if you want to say anything else. And then... the, the, I mean, the, the, it was interesting. You said that you you are far from everything. You you are not really far from everything. You are in the center of everything. Things are uh, defined by European terms, that's the difficulty. Because even East and West is defined by European terms. So you are in the right location. People are far from you. Yes, yes, I agree. But sometimes me being uh, so far away, I remember when I went to Malaysia for a conference back in 2010, people could, do, could not understand how I was traveling 30 hours to reach there. Uh, but well, I think now uh, the proximity with, with, with the virtual encounters and the webinars uh, is 
has changed, and I think we are uh, very, um, very, very near than before. But in terms of when we have to to do the the trips and everything, I still am far away. I'm 14 hours from every from, from everything. But I, I agree. I agree that we have to stop seeing the word European Center or or American Center and started to see it that everyone in the world is interconnected. Yes, I agree. And but, but you said Malaysia. We, uh, we visited Malaysia Nexus International School in Malaysia for the. Uh, for the IPC training, IPC management, we were there, and uh, I heard a very nice description of Istanbul there. They said Istanbul is east enough to make us feel home, and west enough to have a liberal life. That was a very good uh, definition of Istanbul. Yeah, I think Istanbul is a great place. I was there in 2012, and I think also it's it's very uh, culturally it was. The Byzantine Empire, then Constantinople, and it was the door before between the Western and the, and the, and the Eastern world. But I think uh, it's much on the center of the world than Europe, uh, geographically speaking. But, yeah. Well, I, I I I don't think we have any more questions. So I want to thank you, Mukahid, for this talk and and, and your presentation. This uh, would be. Um, uh, this webinar will stay in, in, in our YouTube channel, so you can uh, see it whenever you, you, you need. And also, a lot of, of teachers use, use the, these webinars for classes and to, to show how the, the, the internationalism and international education started, and also for history purposes. So, so I think it's very valuable. Thank you very much, Mukahid, and, and, and hope to see you soon, presentially. Same here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Have a good one.